I want to show you just exactly how much catamaran you can get for under $300,000. And that's a pretty broad statement. And, and as I do with most of these videos, I put in some, some disclaimers, if you will, about what it is that I'm really commenting on. Because there's so many different ways to get on the water and go live aboard sailing. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a catamaran, it can be monohull. Uh, and, uh, but one of, one of the reasons I'm doing this video is just simply to give folks an idea of what you can really get at a certain price point. Because I think there's a lot of people looking at catamarans and they'd like to be on a catamaran. Um, and it is challenging to be on a catamaran. So uh, to get to actually get there, to make that leap and get to the boat. And the prices of catamarans are incredibly high. They're a lot of money. There's no other way to say it. And when you start getting more economical catamarans, then you start running into, or can run into, some pretty significant problems with the boats. So when I was looking, and my wife was, we were both looking, it was very difficult for us to gauge whether it was even possible. And the reason that we're doing this video is that I, I really want to show folks, here is a real transaction, something that went down in the real world in recent time about how much money got paid, uh, what you got in return, what the quality of the boat is, and not just from the sales pitch point of view where you get the video from the broker showing you all the great things about the boat. I'm actually, and that's not what this is, we're not going to be like fluffing this boat and saying, oh, look how what a great vessel we got. It's, it's amazing. We got this amazing buy. The simple truth is we didn't get the boat that we wanted. Um, and there are a lot of things that are not great about this boat. There's a lot of things that are good about this boat, but right up front in the beginning, I'm going to cover the ugly things about this boat that were the biggest question marks that we had. But in the end, we knew we were just going to have to deal with and get after, you know, they, they were, they were okay enough that we could still go and get on our trip. But we knew we know that at some point they're going to have to be addressed and i'm going to put those right at the front of the video make sure you stick around to the last part of the video so you see the really good things about the boat because there's a lot of good about this boat too uh, including just simply the fact that it got us here we're out here we're actually doing it as i sit recording this on the west end of new providence island in the bahamas which is where nasa is so um before we get going on the details, uh, if you could like and subscribe, help us on our journey. We're underway. We'd like to keep this going, and we'd like to keep bringing these honest messages to you. Um, the The boat that we really wanted was a Royal Cape Majestic 53, and it was a lot more money than what we ended up buying this boat for. Uh, and we did a profile, another video, for the Royal Cape Majestic 53 that you can look at where we take you on another realistic boat tour when we were shopping for it. Not the broker's view, the seller's view, but showing you the good things and the bad things about the boat. Uh, but we thought that that was going to be the boat that we wanted. We could get financed for it. We had the budget for it. We, uh, well, I shouldn't say we could get financed because we actually, in the end, did not get finance for the boat and that was a big story that people have seemed to like hearing and learning about too is we published a video about the ugly truths of financing a blue water catamaran uh, and it is ugly and and we were ultimately denied as you'll find out in the video if you go watch that video if you haven't watched it already um, and so as a result we had to adjust our plan we had to you know, that's if there's a message, if I'm trying to deliver any message, it's not uh, bragging about, hey, we did it, or uh, look how great our boat is. It's it, the, my message to you is that we all have budgets. Some of us say there's people out there with budgets that are a lot higher than ours, and there are people out there with budgets that are a lot smaller than ours, and we, they just are what they are, and you adjust to that budget. There are a lot of great boats out there at your budget. And even if it's not a catamaran, if, if, if we'd found out that we could not get a reasonable catamaran for an amount of money that we could pay cash for, we would have shifted our plans and selected a monohull. And because there are some, for the amount of money that you can get for a, a, a an okay but beat up catamaran, you can get a really good monohull uh, out there in, in many cases and, and not have as much work to do. Uh, but as with everything, there are trade-offs. So 
uh, watch those videos, watch the Royal Cape Majestic 53 review, watch the Ugly Truths About Boat Financing, and that will explain to you how we got where we are today on the boat that we did select, which is a 2005 Leopard 43. Um, and we actually didn't know this until after we bought it. It happens to be, that's the same year and model that Sailing with the Winds uh, got going on their adventure as they, they were on a 2005 Leopard 43. Of course, they bought it a lot closer to 2005, so it was a newer boat in much better condition than ours is. And it was also the owner's version, where we have a four cabin version. Um, and that's about where the comparisons end between the two boats because this boat is it's the same boat But in so many ways, it's just not the same boat that the winds were sailing around on and we're gonna get into that right away This boat was originally listed at uh, $320,000 when we started when we looked at the boat and our budget was under 300 so we weren't looking at it specifically because of that fact but one of the brokers said, hey, while you're here looking at a different boat, come take a look at this one that's just a little bit outside your range because I think he had a feeling that they would probably move on price. And he showed us this boat. And we ended up uh, offering $290,000 for the boat. And it was uh, immediately accepted. Uh, not no, no haggle, no counter, no anything. We had kind of learned and heard that from our broker that um, you know, 10% asking 10% under on a boat, it's listing is usually pretty reliable. Uh, asking more gets a little dicey and sometimes you get uh, folks to walk away. I, I would go back and recommend not because I want you to get stuck on price, but just uh, as a good practice, maybe go a little bit deeper on your initial offer when you, uh, in terms of a discount, when you are trying to buy a boat in this price range and it might get accepted. Um, but, uh, and, and then after we did the survey and found things that were, uh, that we would want to work on and do, uh, with the consultation of our broker, felt like that we could get it down to $282,000. And once again, that was immediately accepted with no counter, no offer. They took the $282,000. So in retrospect, my guess is we probably could have done better on price and we would have gotten it for even lower than 282 because uh, obviously the, the seller was, was either highly motivated and just needed to get out for some reason and, and didn't want to mess with it, or uh, he knew that there was some significant things that needed some attention on the boat and was glad to be shot of those problems. Um, but I think the reason we're still happy with what we did and we feel like we got an okay price for the boat is because we we were we were ready to move and if they have that message that i want to deliver is don't let five ten percent of a boat price hold you back from getting on your adventure and getting on the water uh don't don't get married to an exact boat so that if you find out that you can't quite reach that goal that you uh, are saying, well, I just can't do it because it's not gonna be exactly the way that I want it. It's not gonna be exactly the boat that I want or the year that I want or the condition that I want. If you want to be successful in, in breaking free from the land life and getting out on the water, you have to have some flexibility in your plan and be able to go with what you have, go with what your budget allows. So I think the first thing to cover about the uh, the ugly things about this boat was the condition of the heads. We are uh, uh, we are people with a large crew. We have people, multiple people coming sailing with us all the time. We like to have a lot of people on board and we need the cabins. The previous owners, right or wrong, not a comment on the way that they chose to run the boat, but they, I think, only occasionally had people visit on board. So they had modified this particular Leopard 43 considerably to kind of make it more like the owner's version. Uh, and it's a four head, four cabin, four head layout, but um, three of the heads are effectively non-operational. On the starboard side, something happened. I'm not sure exactly what went down. It may be a combination of things, but 
the there's one head on the starboard side forward that is a composting head and we'll probably do a video on the composting head because the jury is definitely out on whether we like that or not uh surprisingly i'm the one that's kind of against it and my wife is sort of for it she has liked the composting head so far because they really do do a good job keeping odor down when maintained properly um, and I'm just not as big of a fan of the maintenance that we might have to do to maintain them. Um, but we'll get to that in another video. The, the aft head is just completely disabled. And even some of the fiberglass structure in the aft head has been removed and rebuilt because the, the holding tank on the starboard side is just gone. It's not even there anymore. Um, and we, I, I have a feeling because on the, that, that the reason that they took that out is that they probably had a tank rupture is my guess. I don't know this for the previous owners, but I know I think this because on the port side on the heads, the tank uh, we couldn't detect any leaks in the in the edges and the seams, but there are two dime size holes right in the side of the tank. Uh, aluminum tanks. I, it was a mistake that boat manufacturers, not just Leopard or all, all kinds of boat manufacturers, put in aluminum holding tanks in, around this time frame. Because and the reason it's a mistake is because uh, your uric acid is very corrosive to aluminum, and it causes the seams to separate and leak and holes to develop and rust through and things like that. Uh, so I, I'm suspecting that that's what happened is that they lost the uh, tank to some type of corrosion, and to clean it up and fix the problem and get the tank out, they actually had to to disassemble part of the fiberglass on that side of the boat. Um, and then to make matters worse for us now, when we try to put things back together, uh, they also seem to cannibalize the water system for the starboard head system and utilize that for air conditioning on the boat, which is a good thing to have. It's great to have the AC on the boat and we'll cover that too, but the uh, what they did was they took the through hull fitting and the water pumps and strainers for the air conditioning, the seawater for the air conditioning, and redirected that to the AC. And at the moment, there is no through hull fitting or water pump or strainer if I want to put plumbed a plumbed head back into the starboard sides. I'm going to have to take the boat out of the water. We're going to have to put new through hull fittings in. We're going to have to maybe take apart what they built together so we can fit a new tank in there. It's a pretty massive project. Um, so, and then on the port side, the tank had the hole in it. And even though they, they were using the forward starboard head, an electric head on board, the way that they were getting away with using it is that they were just leaving the seacock to the tank open 100% of the time, probably even when they were in harbors and anchorages and things like that. Because I think this, this particular design, the, the inbound feed to the tank is on the bottom end of the tank, just like the drain is on the bottom end of the tank. M many other design systems will wrap that around and put the inbound feed on the top side of the tank uh, and and the drain in the bottom but in this case it helped them deal with the holes because as long as they sept, uh, left the, that seacock open I think the way that they were getting away with using it is that the level of the fluid in the tank could never build very high and it would just drain out into the ocean as soon as they used it so the holes in the tank really weren't causing them any type of a functional problem but we're gonna see if we can get that straightened out with some JB Weld and move forward. Um, so, but they also uh, took out the aft head entirely. Uh, the They were big on storage space and they had this, when we shot for the boat, it was like packed full of all kinds of extra gear because they their, their mentality was not to accommodate people, it was to accommodate stuff and carry it on board and that's fine everybody has their own ways of they want to spend their time in their boat and what they want to do uh, but because theirs was quite a bit different than the way that we would like to do it that's probably the most ugly thing that we have about this boat that we're going to have to get over and find a way to work with and we're working on that right now um, probably the next most ugly thing is the engines the engines uh, were not well maintained, but they are good Cummins diesel engines. So 
Um, they run, and they've been running very, very well, but there have been a lot of little problems about the engines that we have to deal with, um, including the on the instrument panel, this has to do with the alternator, I think. Uh, we got some alternator problems that I've kind of fixed, but uh, not necessarily ABYC standards. And uh, the gauges on for the engines aren't fully functional. They're not getting the information. So one of them is we have no idea what the engine hours on these particular engines are. And just based on the number of years the boat's been in service, we can kind of get an estimate that it's probably around six or seven thousand dollars or seven thousand hours on the engines. So we, we we probably have an engine rebuild a repower coming in the next three to five years is something that we know that we're going to have to plan for on this boat. Um, something else that comes with a boat of this age and at this price point is that uh, there's there's some significant hull damage to the boat. Um, and the boat is a dry boat. We didn't notice that on the inside and that's one of the reasons we picked it is that there is not signs of really very much water getting to the inside of the boat and that gave us a lot of confidence there. However, on the survey, uh, some significant wet spots were detected in the hull. Uh, not to the point that the boat's gonna break apart, but ones that we know that, yep, we're gonna have to address them at some point in time. And they have clearly done had some work done to the to the prows of each hull uh, have been rebuilt probably because they were getting soft and they spent a lot of time on anchor and they needed to strengthen those up so that the anchor points would uh, for the bridle is what I'm referring to would hold solidly uh, but on the aft end uh, not as much there's a, a by, by the cleats the uh, the cleats are a little soft and non-functional. Well, they're functional, but they're, uh, they're, they're not behaving quite like they should. Uh, and uh, there's some water in the hull, uh, on the, uh, but it's all above the water line. There was no significant wetness detected below the water line, which was encouraging to us. Um, so that was certainly something that was not really great about this boat. Um, and, and, but those are really the, those are the, the ugly things right there are those things that I just kind of listed off. Um, and then because it's a boat of the year 2005, there are some things that just aren't great. They're expected wear and tear, you know, uh, many of the screens that are and shades that are built over the hatches, uh, have just through use been kind of you know twisted and bent and the shades and screens aren't recoiling properly and they're going to have to get replaced uh the the propane uh, oven and cooktop the cooktop works just fine the oven is we tried to bake some stuff in it not very useful can't get a high temperature in the oven uh and, and i don't think that's terribly uncommon for uh for marine cooking systems of this age um so uh that but that wasn't great um we also they modified again for storage the aft bunks um and we want to put people in there but uh um on the starboard side they built a shelving unit that they just piled a bunch of stuff into and cut the bunk cushions down to something that would accommodate a very small person but not a full-grown adult and i'm gonna have to kind of undo some of that and we're gonna have to rebuild the cushions so we can put people back there on the port side they've got full cushions uh but they kind of customized their they they wanted to carry a lot of uh freezers uh and like portable dometic, dometic freezers which actually have been kind of nice to have on board um however they use the aft cabin to store them so once again we could put a very small person in there but not a full-size person so we're going to be looking to find new homes for the freezers and do some rewiring by taking those freezers and probably moving them into some v-birth spaces which it, it was it's kind of an oddity with the leopard design i'm not 100 percent certain what they had in mind with this space usage it, it is a v-birth birth you could put a human in there there are it's not much ventilation there's just one little porthole there's no room for anything other than a body if you were going to try to sleep in it um so we're never going to put people in those spaces 
uh, I think after with a little bit of rewiring, they're going to be the new homes of the freezers that are in the port aft cabins, aft cabins, so we can open up uh, that space for, for people to come stay with us. One thing about our boat that is kind of on the difficult side is these uh, portholes are really, really hard to close. you got to put a lot of effort into them um, when they close down. I, I think the gaskets have been re redone, and that's why they're, they're just a little bit bigger. But you really got to press it in there. And often my wife can't get this done, and I've got to come in here and do them. A uh, lot of pressure. But on the upside, they're dry. They don't leak. And... One of the things that I like about the Leopard very much over the Lagoon in the 2000s area, era 2005 is this year again, is that they, it's a small thing, but it's a big thing. Leopard chose to use appropriate material in spots that are likely going to get wet. Every sailor, if you've been sailing for any length of time, has been caught a little bit by a storm coming in or waves started spraying and you had a porthole open and you've got to scramble to get the portholes closed uh, and but invariably you're a little late and water gets in this this surface right below these portholes is gonna get wet and one of the things that I noticed about the lagoons even on the 2017 lagoon that I sailed in the the video that, that we did about lagoons and while we'll never buy them is that they chose beautiful material but it, if you go find the forward facing portholes in any lagoon in the mid 2000s range you're gonna find that this surface is is trashed it's it's often heavily delaminated or showing water damage all kinds of things because they just simply didn't pick a material that could get wet this is right above the galley sink it's right underneath the portholes People are going to put dishes up here that are wet. They're going to drip. Water's going to come in through the portholes. And this material, it, it shows there are some water stains and things on the material. Um, and it has gotten wet. But 18 years later, I don't feel this has been refitted in any way. 18 years later, every bit of this surface is still sound and performing its core function. It's not delaminating. It's not coming apart. And that's just simply because Robertson and Kane, or whomever in the organization made the decision, chose to pick a material for this area that could withstand a little bit of water. Um, the other things like uh, the the floor uh, for me is just it's just tired. It's functional. We have one place where there's a board that's kind of delaminated a little bit that sponges when you step on it. Otherwise, the boards are really really solid. Um, and you can walk on them. They're just worn. They're just looking tired, and uh, and that bothers me. It's odd how things, different things bother different people. That one kind of gets to me a little bit. Um, and um, the Corian countertops are in decent shape, but I think they could be kind of renewed and easy enough to do. Uh, what bothers my wife is the way that some of the joints come together. And on about this side, you will find you look at the the caulking of the way surfaces come together and it's starting to dry and crack and separate and spots in the headliner are starting to sag and things are kind of coming apart and you're getting gaps here and there. Those are the things that really kind of bother her more. Uh, but these are all things that are very typical of an 18 year old boat and just kind of come along with, uh, with the landscape. Um, so, those are things that are not great about the boat, but they're okay, and it's just kind of things that I, I think with any any 2005 boat, you're gonna get some of that, and you, you just in different services, whatever the case is, it's really just kind of avoidable. But there's a lot of things that were really, really good about this boat. What one of the things is is it's a leopard, and uh, leopards, especially of this era were have a very very good retail value their name brand is maybe a better way to say that uh, I, I think it's probably safe to say that for the mid 2000s you know 2005 time frame leopard was one of the top three manufacturing brands of catamarans known globally probably uh, leopard fontaine peugeot and of course um 
uh, the uh, lagoons. Uh, lagoons are still very popular, but uh, not with us. We much prefer being on the leopard. And the leopard's just, you know, so a leopard's a good, solid sailing catamaran. And this boat sails well. It really does. It's got not new sails, but newer within a few years. Uh, and they're in good shape. They're not stretched out. The, the standing rigging is, is newer, within a couple years old. So we've got good life on that. And the chain plates are well bedded and not have any softness around the chain plates. So we've got every confidence in the, uh, every bit of confidence in the rigging, uh, holding up and doing what we wanted to do. We, um, we know uh, that we're gonna have to replace some of the running rigging is a little dried and getting brittle. So some of the running rigging is gonna have to get done within in the next couple of years. Uh, the, uh, aside from the brand and it's got a great uh, sailing, it's a great sailing boat. Uh, another amazing thing about this boat is that they really invested some money into uh, the uh, solar system and the power system, electrical power. And underneath the bench in the cockpit, uh, we have four 300 amp hour lithium batteries. So those are, that's 1200 amp hours of battery power. And we have uh, uh, 1050 watts total of solar power coming off of the array that's on top of the dinghy davits at the back of the boat. And, you know, that, that helps us live independently even with the freezers running so that those freezers that we said are kind of pop that we kind of like they're the biggest assault on our energy i feel and uh even with them running it, it's we're when we run them all we are a little energy negative if we shut them off then the boat can run energy positive so it just kind of depends on what we're doing about managing that uh and they did send along a a good portable generator that if we have days, cloudy days, where we're starting to lose on the energy, we can fire up the generator and connect it into the solar power system and actually charge the batteries back up with that source as well. There's no built-in generator into this boat. So there's using a portable Honda kind of quiet generator, put it out in the scoop, sugar scoop, hook it up to the power cord, and that's our way to work around not having a generator on board. Um, so that the electric is a real, the electricity is a really really good thing about this boat. Those batteries, that 1,200 amp hours of the batteries, that's over ten thousand dollars worth of batteries right there, just inside that aft um, that seat right there. So that was great to see. The boat has a built-in Spectra water maker that produces about seven to eight gallons per hour. And that's been very handy to keep our water tanks topped off as we run around the Bahamas without uh, really good access to fresh water. The, the navigation equipment, the electronics, all working really, really well, very reliable, so we can get up and get around and, and do what we need to do there. The autopilot is working as built, you know, it's doing exactly what it should. One thing that's kind of annoying about the way they put things together is next to, on the starboard side where, where the main halyard is run and next to the helm, they put in a power winch and just a little bit of a design afterthought there is that the, uh, the, the uh, mistake, they, the winch was installed, the motor for the winch was installed too close to the flux gate compass for the autopilot. So when you run, if you have the autopilot running and you power the winch, uh, it the electromagnetic field generated by the motor in the winch starts screwing with the compass in the autopilot and it will start to radically swing 40 to 50 degrees to starboard when you start running the, uh, the autopilot winch. So those are some of the idiosyncrasies that come along with getting a boat like this. Um, so, uh, but otherwise, great electronics. The, the cushions are in really good shape throughout. Uh, um, and I think they did some uh, new, you know, replace some cushions and kind of did some things to get ready to sell the boat. The cushions in the aft cabin, not because they're in poor shape, but just because they cut them down to work with uh, storing all the gear in the freezers, uh, they're in good shape, but not the cushions that we want. We got a little bit of work to do there. Uh, the AC runs fine. 
um, it, there's a, a, I, I've got to investigate a little bit of a power problem and I had to get in and clean out some barnacles that were restricting the water flow on the intake for the AC, but we have run the AC off the generator and off the dock power and shore power and it, it, it really does a, a very acceptable job cooling off the boat. Um, and we like the refrigeration on the boat. It's a little modern, uh, a little modified and <laughs> not standard. Um, but they took the refrigeration units that were, uh, uh, I think originally it was a part refrigerator, part freezer, and they somehow disabled the freezer part in the refrigeration unit, or maybe it broke and they just never chose to fix it. And they turned it into one big refrigerator. And then they got these three portable freezers that are on board for frozen goods. And at first we were a little skeptical about that, but then we realized that if we could manage the power on them, which it seems that we can in some situations, then it's really nice having a big freezer full of ice and being able to keep ice cream on board and other uh, and freeze meat and things that uh, we want to hold with us for a long time because uh, grocery shopping, as many of you know, down here in the Bahamas and really any of the island countries can get really, really expensive. So anytime we can get cheaper provisioning and hold on to it and freeze it, that's a good thing for us. So the freezers have actually turned out to be kind of a good thing, even if not a standard thing as part of the boat. Um, so uh, just to kind of wrap up, this is, this is what you get for less than $300,000 on a boat. We feel like we got a pretty good deal on the boat and it has certainly not disappointed. We, the, the greatest thing about this boat is that we are doing it. We are out here on the water, underway, visiting places, uh, spending our time here instead of spending our time on land, working uh, and, and living the rat race as we all like to call it. We have successfully broken free mostly. We've still got a few ties that we're working with, but we're getting a lot closer to um, to, to being out and living the living the dream, living the goal that we're after, which is to get on the boat full time and start sailing around the world. And I hope that you can find a path to come join us and we'll see you out here on the open water sometime soon.